some knowledge of how a car works is a good basis for the intelligent use of its controls, and that is an early important step towards becoming a good driver. Here's the chassis of a car, the basic frame with wheels attached. Many modern cars incorporate the chassis with the body, but this one is separate. The rear wheels which drive the car are connected by the rear axle assembly. But the front wheels are each mounted independently. They are, however, connected by the steering linkage, which assures that both wheels will turn together in answer to movements of the steering wheel. The conventional place for the engine is under the front bonnet, with the fuel tank at the rear. Attached behind the engine is the transmission. We add some controls and a box with seats in it. We have chassis, wheels, engine, clutch, gearbox, controls and body. All we need is a body shell to make it look right. Some of the body panels in this car have been cut away to give a better view of the working parts. Let's see how they do work, beginning with the engine. Power comes from pistons in cylinders. You can see how they work in this model. The cylinder is a tube sealed at the top. In the top are two valves. When the inlet valve opens, it lets in a mixture of fuel and air. The exhaust valve allows the gases to be expelled after the mixture has been used. Both valves are held closed by these strong springs. An electric current is fed to the spark plug which ignites the fuel and air mixture. The piston in the cylinder is connected by a rod to the crankshaft at the bottom of the engine. As the piston moves up and down, the connecting rod causes the crankshaft to turn. Around each piston, rings stop the gases from escaping. Each movement is called a stroke. And each stroke has a different function. On the intake stroke, the inlet valve opens and the mixture is sucked into the cylinder. The inlet valve closes and the mixture is compressed up here. This is the compression stroke. The spark plug ignites the mixture and expanding gases force the piston down, turning the crankshaft. This is the power stroke. The exhaust valve opens to let the burnt gases out. The inlet valve opens, lets the mixture into the cylinder and closes. The mixture is compressed, the spark ignites it and expanding gases force the piston down, turning the crankshaft. The exhaust valve opens to release the burnt gases and that is the cycle of the engine. Intake, compression, power stroke, and exhaust. This is a six-cylinder engine, partly cut away so that we can see the action. Here we can see the rings, which help to prevent gases escaping past the piston. Each of the six pistons is connected by its own rod to the crankshaft. This is the cylinder head, actually six cylinder heads in one casting. For each cylinder there is an exhaust and an inlet valve. And we can also see the electrodes of the spark plug. The cylinder head bolts tightly onto the top of the cylinder block. On the top of the cylinder head, we can see the mechanisms which open and close the valves. 
These rods push the rockers, which operate with a seesaw action. The rods, in turn, are lifted by cams, which are offset wedges on the camshaft. The camshaft is chain or gear driven by the crankshaft, so that once set or timed, the mechanism will always open each valve at exactly the right instant. The valves are automatically closed by powerful springs. The camshaft also drives the distributor and the fuel pump. The pump brings petrol to the carburetor, which atomizes fuel and air into a highly combustible spray and regulates the supply of the mixture to the cylinders of the engine. The carburetor has two valves, an accelerator valve and a choke valve, both of which are operated from inside the car. A small pipe takes fuel from the reservoir while air is sucked through the main tube. When the accelerator valve opens, air is sucked through the carburetor, dragging fuel into the tube through the small pipe from the reservoir chamber. And here, the fuel atomizes in the stream of air. By pressing the accelerator pedal, the accelerator valve opens correspondingly, allowing more mixture into the engine, thus producing more power. When we pull the choke out, we cut down the amount of air going into the carburetor, making the mixture richer, as is required when the engine is cold. When the choke control is pushed in, the mixture returns to normal. This is suitable for running the engine once an adequate operating temperature has been reached. This is the carburetor. Here's the accelerator valve. This is the choke valve, and there we can see the small tube which leads to the fuel reservoir, which is this square chamber. The whole carburetor is belted to the engine here. The air cleaner fits on top, and this device filters dust and dirt from the air before it is sucked into the carburetor. There is the choke valve, and the supply line from the petrol pump. This system of linkage rods connects the accelerator pedal to the accelerator valve of the carburetor. And here's the cable by which the choke control operates the choke valve. The mixture of fuel and air is fed to the cylinders by way of the intake manifold. Used gases are passed out along a similar manifold below, and sensibly enough, this is called the exhaust manifold which is connected to the exhaust pipe underneath the car. Gases pass along the pipe to the silencer, where they pass through small openings called baffles. This has the effect of reducing the noise and cooling the gases before they pass through the tailpipe at the rear of the car. This is a small electric motor which is used to start the engine. When the starter control is operated, the motor turns pushing out this small gear, which engages with the teeth on the flywheel, which can be seen here. This turns the engine, sucking fuel mixture into the cylinders. The spark plugs fire, the engine starts, and the small gear disengages. The starter motor is fixed here. The battery provides power for electrical parts of the car. It contains a number of lead plates covered by a sulfuric acid solution. One battery lead goes to the electrical parts and switches, and to save double wiring, the metal body of the car is used as the return wire. We can see this lead connecting the battery to the engine head in this case. This is the coil, whose function is to boost power from the battery for the purpose of igniting fuel mixture in the cylinders. It accepts low voltage electricity from the battery, transforming this to the high voltage necessary to cause a spark across the electrodes of the plugs. Both high and low voltage circuits of the coil are connected to the distributor. 
we can see the rotor arm which distributes high voltages to each sparking plug in turn. The distributor points are operated by cams. Each time the points open, low tension electricity passes through the coil and is transformed to a burst of high voltage electricity across the electrodes of a spark plug. The distributor is driven by the camshaft and correctly installed will always cause each spark plug to fire at exactly the correct instant. As the mixture in a cylinder ignites, a great deal of heat is generated. To prevent the engine from overheating, each cylinder is surrounded by a water jacket. And the water is circulated by a pump situated here and controlled by a thermostat situated here. Water absorbs heat, passes into the top of the radiator and downwards through fine pipes surrounded by copper fins. The movement of the car and the action of the fan draw air through the radiator, which has the effect of cooling the water. From the bottom of the radiator, the cooled water circulates back through the water jacket, and thus the cycle continues. As most radiators operate under pressure, they have a pressure seal cap, which needs to be removed slowly when the engine is hot. Down to the right of the engine, and driven by the fan belt, is the alternator, this provides electrical power to recharge the battery. On some cars, a generator is fitted to perform the same task. Below the engine block, the crankshaft turns, driving the other moving parts. The oil pump operates down here, forcing oil at pressure to surfaces where metal moves on metal. In operation, the bottom of the engine block is covered with a sump, which also acts as an oil reservoir. The flywheel is bolted to the rear end of the crankshaft. Seen from the other side, the flywheel incorporates the clutch. This model makes it easier to understand. The clutch is the link between engine and gearbox. It has two discs or plates lined with a special material. These are held together by a powerful spring. The linings cause the plates to grip together tightly when the spring tension is on. As the engine turns, both clutch plates turn transmitting power through to the gearbox. When we press the clutch pedal, we produce the effect of easing the spring pressure. The plates begin to slip, and the power is no longer transmitted from engine to gearbox. The clutch is usually hidden, but in our cutaway, we can see some of the springs which keep up the pressure on the plates. To the rear of the clutch is the gearbox, a device which allows us to apply greater engine power to a low road speed for starting or climbing steep hills, and alternatively, to provide less power to maintain normal road speeds. This is a simplified model of the gearbox. The engine is turning this shaft. The gear is in the neutral position, so that although the engine shaft is turning, power is still not being transmitted to the wheels. We move the gear lever to the low gear position. This engages the small gear on the engine shaft with the large gear on the drive shaft. When the engine turns now, the drive shaft also turns. The drive shaft gear is four times the diameter of the engine shaft gear. Thus, the engine turns four times to produce one revolution of the drive shaft. This gives us greater engine power for a low road speed. When we move the gear lever to the high gear position, the large gear on the engine shaft engages with the gear of the same diameter on the drive shaft. Now, when the engine turns one revolution, the drive shaft also turns one revolution. This is the situation of providing lower engine power to maintain normal road speeds. The actual gearbox is rather more complex than the model. When the gear lever is moved, the relevant gears engage and power is transmitted from the engine to the driving wheels of the car. 
the back axle incorporates another arrangement of gears called the differential. The back axle assembly is attached to the car on large springs. Shock absorbers are fitted to overcome the bouncing effect of the springs. The front suspension springs are known from their shape as coil springs and support swinging arms. The shock absorbers fit inside the springs. This suspension arrangement gives the car stability on the road, provides a smooth ride and saves space to allow the wheels to turn. When the steering wheel is turned, the shaft inside the steering box transmits the movement, which becomes a pulling and pushing action underneath the car. From this, the steering linkage mechanism turns both front wheels together. Each wheel has its own brake, and by removing the drum, we can see how it all works. There is the backing plate, which is firmly attached to the axle. The two brake shoes are pivoted at one end and held by springs against two small pistons at the other. When the pistons push outwards, the brake shoes push outwards too, and their linings come in contact with the inside surface of the brake drum, causing it and the attached wheel to stop turning. When the brake pedal is pressed, power is transferred from the pedal to the brake shoes. A pump, known as the master cylinder, forces brake fluid through tubes to each wheel cylinder. This forces the small pistons outwards, expanding the brake shoes. And the brake linings come into contact with the drums, stopping the wheel. On each wheel, a multi-ply tyre makes a soft cushion for the car to ride on. The tyres have strong walls, a deep rubber tread, and are reinforced by air pressure from the inside. Tyre treads grip the road, giving traction and stability, while their flexibility works with the springs and shock absorbers to give a smooth, comfortable ride. This has been a very quick rundown on how the motor car works. In later films, we will see how to check and maintain the engine and other components. And we shall see how to drive safely and responsibly.